Okay. Uh, <coughs> so thanks for coming. So this is part of the 2023 observer course, but you don't necessarily have to be doing the observer course. That this makes sense. Um, and it's just a short um, piece on surveying seagrass habitats. So some caveats, um, because we did one on kelp and watching the recording back, I, I'm not entirely happy with, with how it came across. So I, I'm not a seagrass expert. I don't, I don't uh, pretend to be. Um, this is not an exhaustive list of species that you would find in seagrass habitats. Um, this is not intended to teach identification of all the species shown, and it's actually one of the reasons why I don't go into the identification as much tonight as I did with the previous one on uh, kelp, because there's an awful lot of confusion species with some of these species, and there just isn't the time to go through the sort of minutiae you need to learn how to identify all these species. So it's more just sort of a general guide of the, the sort of species you'd expect to see in seagrass and then just some direction on how to go about identifying these, which you would do by consulting a specialist ID guide. And then in terms of actually surveying seagrass, uh, the Smithsonian has a very detailed methodology on how to survey seagrass beds. And if you were, particularly if you were looking to monitor the health of an individual patch of seagrass, rather than just surveying seagrass in general, um, that would be what you'd want to do is you'd want to do quadrats and look at the density of the seagrass um, measure the area of, uh, of the seagrass bed, things like that. Um, all of which we could, we could help you with. Um, and indeed, um, um, Ed Shelton, who, who's um, one of uh, one of our recorders is involved um, in a project down in Kerry um, in, in Venice on seagrass. Uh, he's kindly offered that if anyone collects uh, GIS data, or sorry, um, GPS data of their seagrass bed, he will uh, help them map it um, uh, so they can visualize it. And then finally, we're talking about sublittoral sub seagrass beds here, rather than Zoster Noltei or surveying at um, low tide. Um, if you want material on that, um, Explore Your Shore would be um, the first protocol, and then um, Coast Watch Ireland also do some work on that in that area. When I said specialist um, uh, guides, this is mostly what I'm talking about. These um, sea search guides to marine life in um, Britain and Ireland, um, they're all published by the Marine Conservation Society, and you can find them on the website there, um, including the new one, um, Intro Fishes of Britain and Ireland. But um, like that, things like the sea crowds and anemones, it'd be something you'd, you'd need to have for identifying some of the species I'm going to talk about tonight. Um, and then just to mention on the 8th of May, uh, there'll be a talk in the uh, Atlantic Aquarium in Galway uh, called the Serengeti of the Seas, um, Seagrasses and the Forgotten Ecosystem, which will be, um, uh, there's, um, Jonathan and Kathleen and Kate are coming over from the US and they're involved in the Smithsonian and the Maryland Center for Environmental Science. Uh, they are seagrass experts and they're going to be talking about seagrass. Uh, I'll also be throwing in my two cents and then there'll be some local, um, what would you call it, some local color um, added um, and uh, then sort of interactive uh, tour of the aquarium. So well worth uh, come on along to so do these videos never apply It's not going to do it for it. R Rory, uh, if, you, if you play it outside and share your screen, it might work now. Uh, that doesn't. Outside of the presentation. Oh, I know. I'm just trying to find where the video is. <laughs>
Is it a video of seagrass? Perhaps not that one. So just to get an idea of what you're serving, uh, and this isn't actually a particularly dense bed, but you know, there's, a, there's a lot of movement, there's a lot of color, there's a lot going on. It's, it can be difficult at times to separate the, the, um, the woods from the trees, so to speak. But um, like that, you, you can see there's, there's an awful lot of different species in there. There's an awful lot to, to look out for. Um, um, and it is, uh, like it's a fascinating habitat, but it is, it is difficult to survey. Okay, so Zostra marina is a flowering plant, so, <laughs> excuse me, it's obviously slightly unusual to be found in the sea. Um, you get it mainly from two to four meters, that'd be good, um, good, good seagrass and um, depths. Um, tend to be sheltered, shallow in its bays, estuaries, and so on, glooms. They live from two, 20 to 100 years, which I, I didn't know myself. Um, and the sector maturity at one to two years. So, you know, it wouldn't take a hell of a lot of conservation to less seagrass beds that have the potential to recover to um recover and um <laughs> I, I like that one there's a study that shows the dispersal of seeds could be up to a kilometer though at a kilometer the seed mortality is 96 percent so like i don't i don't see what the point would be at that point but um beds have been found to expand by up to 30 meters a year so that's obvious like, like i said there, there's obviously um good potential for seagrass habitat to recover if allowed to. Okay. Those videos are also not playing, they're not even showing up. So that's, that makes things easier. In terms of threats to seagrass bed, um, it's a, one of the big ones is water clarity. So um, it's a flowering plant, it needs um, uh, it needs uh, light to uh, survive. If the water clarity is particularly poor, it will it will die. Um, wave exposure and storms, um, mechanical disturbance, um, including the anchoring of boats, nutrient pollution, um, non-native species, including Sargassum muticum, and then climate. As I think climate is, is always there in the background with, with any marine species. where these graphics have gone. So I will come on to where I gathered all of this information from. So the J, <laughs> excuse me, the JNCC um, have a marine habitat classification for a whole bunch of different marine habitats, obviously, uh, and one of them is sublittoral seagrass beds. So they have a whole bunch of species um, done on the sac four scale based on um, sort of good habitat descriptors of um, some sea seagrass beds. But that was, um, um, you could see the, the distribution of sites um, is a bit uneven and it's largely, a lot of it, uh, it's the red dots, a lot of it is, um, concentrate in certain areas. So if there's a lot of geographical um, variation, then that wouldn't be captured. So one of the other things I tried to do was I pulled out all of the uh, sea search records um, for Ireland where, uh, for sites where Zostra Marina was recorded. And then I looked at the percentage of, of those sites that had other species. Now this isn't, this is a terrible <laughs> method of doing this because obviously the fact that Zostra Marina was recorded at a site doesn't mean that it was just uh, a seagrass bed that was surveyed. Someone could have been surveying a rocky reef and just seen <laughs> the seagrass on their way back to the shore, which I think is why um, lobsters show up on the list further down. But um, you see a lot of the species that, that you would sort of expect to see in a, in a seagrass habitat. So since 
Okay, I'd only get one of the videos to play. This is what uh, this is this is my local seagrass bed in in Galway. And look at that, it's quite dense, quite thick, but you can see looking at it from a distance, it's quite difficult to uh, to make out a lot of the finer details. And it's one of the reasons why really like diving is is the main way to try and try and record um in seagrass habitat because you you're static, you can you can look down, you can take a closer look at things. But also, um, you know, if you're sort of duck diving while snorkeling, um, you're going to you're going to scare off an awful lot of the stuff that's in there. So the species marked in yellow are ones that we have added based on the sort of anecdotally what um, what divers oh, what uh, what divers can think they should be seeing in a um, a seagrass habitat, whereas um, the other ones are the ones that are either described in the JNCC or showed up in the uh, heavily in the seagrass re records. So there was sort of six Nidarians that um, you should really should be looking out for. Um, Snakelocks and enemies, burning enemies, daily enemies, Antipolora balli, which doesn't seem to have a common name, a compass jellyfish and then stalk jellyfish, which is just a group of, of small, um, the, the star middle is, uh, they're, not, they're not really jellyfish, but, uh, but then in terms of crustaceans, all the common ones um, are there. In a kind of terms, common species, um, seaweeds, so things like sugar kelp, wireweed, cordophyllum, uh, the, the green seaweeds, and then um, things like sea oak and sea beach, um, and all, all of the red seaweeds, but you don't really have the time this evening to be going into a, a long discussion on, on red seaweeds. And then in terms of mollusks, um, because it's a largely a, a sandy habitat, you'd expect to find um, scallops, you'd expect to find sand masons, you'd expect to find lugworms, peacock worms, top shells, periwinkle seagrass, all of those things. And then fish, fish is, I suppose, one of the ones where seagrass really comes into its own. So you'd expect to find dragonets, you'd expect to find place, you'd expect to find oh, a whole host of wrasse, dogfish, two spot goby, um, corcoran wrasse, pollock. And then stickleback pipefish and um, the short spined um, sea scorpion were all ones that people mentioned as that they consider sort of ubiquitous with um, seagrass habitat. So, just sort of to go through um, some of those species and uh, some quick ID tips for the ones that can be identified. And then we'll go. Anyway, so snake locks and enemies are extremely distinctive, both sort of in the shape and their coloration. Um, and one that you can um, you can really identify very quickly off the bat. Um, I thought the lovely um, purple tips to the uh, to the tentacles, uh, and really, I'd be a bit worried about your local sea seagrass patch if you weren't seeing um, a lot of snake locks and enemies in there during the summer. Then. This is an interesting one that sort of showed up in the data, which I wouldn't really normally associate with um, uh, seagrass habitats, but um, who might argue with the data? And also, um, it's just a, it's a good species to identify. So it's, it's the burrowing anemone, um, Syrianthus lloydi. Um, it's not really something you've got to confuse with anything else, um, though they're highly variable in colour. So you, you, you can be tempted to think you've got an awful lot of other things going on. But really, the best way to identify them is get straight over them and look straight down the maw of them like that. And it's just a very distinctive um, shape. Um, and you can count the tentacles and everything. But if you were to look in any of the ID guides, there's, there's nothing really that you could, there's nothing else that really looks like something like this. It's just like that when you, when you start off um, surveying and you're looking at a bright white one, sort of ready one, and this sort of slightly opaque looking guy, you, you're thinking you're seeing a whole lot of different species. Um, daily anemones, again, are a highly uh, distinctive species, very easy to identify, um, very distinctive shape, highly variable in colour, um, but you, you would, um, again, you'd expect to see a certain amount of those in uh, a seagrass habitat. What you really want to, see, what you would really tend to see an awful lot of in um, seagrass habitat is this uh, Anthropolura balli. Um, but it, it's 
quite a tricky species to identify um, and, and you would want to be familiar with the um, that there's another species of Antipolura um, for stars that, that you get in seagrass uh, habitats but this is a very common species in seagrass habitats I just would caution you before you start recording it to pull out a guidebook and have a good long look and um, just be happy um, with the various features you need to identify it Compass jellyfish is the other end of the scale. It's they're extremely distinctive, um, even when seen from the sides um, and slightly uh, washed out looking. You're not going to confuse them with anything else. The star um, metazoa, I'm just going to skip totally by on that. I cannot identify them for the life of me, but this is what a stock jellyfish looks like. And you would if you stop and look closely in a um, a seagrass bite, you will see them um, growing on the, the sea uh, on the seagrass blades. Um, and there's a whole load of different species, but there's a good key on the Starmazoa UK, or sorry, I think Starmazoa.co.uk is the website. In terms of crustaceans, velvet swimming crab is fairly common, I think, in, in most habitats in Ireland. Um, so you'd expect to see a certain amount of those in a, in a seagrass bed. Extremely distinctive, bright red eyes, um, purple um, lines on the carapace and on the legs. And here is a, here's a buried female for Shunkata. And then the shore crab or the green crab, um, with the shown here with the velvet swim crab for contrast. Um, the sort of key diagnostic feature with this is the uh, the back leg is flattened but not expanded into a swimming paddle like it is in the other um, swimming crabs. They can be variable enough in colour, but um, yeah, they're quite a common species. You, you, you're seeing them all, all the time. Once, once you get your eye in, um, you're going to uh, be able to identify them relatively easily. Um, I'll just include this photo because it's just a funny photo and we still to this day have no idea what those crabs were, were doing there. Um, edible crabs, uh, extremely distinctive species, black um, markings on the tips of their pincer and just that um, sort of whatever is a brown pie crust, the shape of the carapace is, is extremely distinctive. Um, you're not going to confuse them on anything else. Um, but I do include this lovely photo, which uh, isn't more marked, but this is um, by uh, uh, Majin Stanskowski from uh, Dawkey Subaka Club. And I just think this is just the, the level of detail that's captured on the edible crab there is, is wonderful. Um, then one of the ones you have to watch out for in, or you would expect to find in seagrass beds are small spindly little spider crabs, which there's a whole bunch of different species, but generally they, they come in two genuses. So there's the Macropodia, which you would expect to find in seagrass beds. And then there's the Anacus, which you don't tend to find in seagrass beds. So this first individual here, this is one of the Anacus ones. The Anacus tend to be, um, they tend to be, uh, the both species tend to have a, a lot of sort of in, encrusting um, algae or sponge or seaweed or whatever. But, um, the anarchist, uh, I, I tend, I tend to think it, it tends to be spawn. It, it tend to find it far more on rocky reefs. So then you find it with stuff that you didn't find on rocky reefs, like sponges. Um, and you can see this guy's got some an enemy stuck to his his claw and everything. Um, but in in terms of like like actually identifying these guys to species, you have to be able to look at the the horns of the rostrum here, which you know would involve like taking them home and and cleaning them, giving them a good clean, which obviously no one is that interested in doing. Whereas the macropodia tend to look far more like um sort of um they're far more spidery looking. They're not as they're not as thick and robust as the anarchus. Um, and these are the ones that you'd expect to find in, in seagrass. Um, and here as 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 shown, but um, again, they can be quite difficult to identify the species. So you're trying to identify them into genus. But again, like if you're not seeing them in your in your seagrass habitat, um, that's not a good sign. And 
actually, this is annoying because I couldn't find a photo of cordophyllum in seagrass, and here's one here. So that's cordophyllum, which will be one of the seaweeds I'll be talking about later. Uh, lobster, um, can't identify lobster. It's the, your optician you need to consult rather than your um, local uh, sea search uh, coordinator. Now, uh, I I realized that um, I said uh, I had hermit crabs on the list earlier, but even in a lengthy ID session on crabs, I don't think we'd get deeply into hermit crabs. But just to say that uh, Pagaris bernardus, the large hermit crab, is one that you can identify based largely on just its large size. So this massive guy here, occupying the wax shell, is Pagaris bernardus. Um, it has to be um, because there's no other hermit crab in Ireland that gets that size. But also when it's that size, um, you can start looking at, though you can't see it from this photo, you can start looking at the various diagnostic features you, you'd need to identify the species. Um, and that's the main problem with the small hermit crabs is you're looking for, for small minute details on small minute things that don't like to hold still. Um, then the... <coughs> I've forgotten the common name of this. The big uh, knobbly starf starfish. Um, what is this called? Um, anyway, the, the big knobbly uh, starfish that's very common that you'll find everywhere. Yeah, you will also find it in seagrass beds. Um, it is extremely distinctive because it's really, really big and really, really knobbly. Uh, Bit of variation in color, but um, you find them in all sorts of different habitats. And uh, like that, like I said, that th was extremely distinctive, grow to very, very large sizes. And then another species you'd expect to find in seagrass beds are um, common starfish, which um, could typically be identified by uh, largely orange in color, but it's more these. White, white nodules on the top of the uh, body that you're looking for. And there, that, that, that guy there is really, is really shown off that you, you see the white, even though it, the photo is, is so faint that you can't see the, uh, the orange color. Okay, so to return to our cordophyllum, because there, there was a bit of it earlier, it's the long, thin, straggly, uh, I think some people refer to it as mermaid tresses, but I, I would caution with this species. The this and its confusion species, the the common names tend to get mixed up as well, which just makes it very difficult to know what you're talking about all the time. So this is one I would just say, just learn the Latin name. It's cordophyllum. Um and even I think that helps because it's long cords, it's got this um uh uh, what would you call it? The, the sort of the, the white case around it to, to identify it. Um, and then the only species you're likely to confuse it with this is this one, the Himmeltalia elongata. Uh, but Himmeltalia tends to be um, much longer, more robust. It doesn't have the doesn't have that white fuzz on it. Um, but the big one is if you're not sure which you, which you have in your habitat. If you go down and um, check the bottom, uh, Himmeltalia um, uh, grows from these buds. Actually, the bud is the, uh, the vegetative part of the plant. The, the long cords is the, the reproductive part, whereas the cordophyllum just tends, it's just growing straight out of the substrate like that. And um, just while we're here, that is sugar kelp big long bits of sugar kelp and then all the spread out um, among us, which are, are both species to expect to find in seagrass as well. Then Sargassum musicum is wireweed. It's an invasive species. Um, it, not really that you're going to confuse it with um, in Irish waters, uh, but these um, uh, the, the nodules on it uh, are extremely distinctive. But um, the, the reason it's invasive and the reason it, it can be a problem is, is like you can see here, it can just it can just take over in places.
Well, that's a large spider crab, um, Maja squinada. Um, you can identify it, if I can pause it at the right point, from the other spider crabs, because you can see the, the two horns in the rostrum that diverge. Okay, I'm just going to mention this to tell you to go off and learn it. I'm not going to um, do it in detail, but the, the sea oak, the Phycodrys rubens, um, there's two species um, that are very similar that can be confused with each other, uh, that have a sort of um, this strong midrib and, and uh, uh, <laughs> right, you do. Excuse me. You'd expect to find both of them in seagrass habitats, but um, the problem is uh, the common names are sea beach and sea oak, sea oak, but it's very hard to tell them apart once they get a bit battered and weathered, which is typically how you tend to find um, seaweeds as the year goes on. But it's just um, supposed just generally to be aware if you want to start getting a, a very good understanding of the of the species that you have in your seagrass habitat, you're going to have to at some point um, pick up a, a pick up a book and get some get some um, waterproof paper uh, and get a couple of weights to do some pressings. And you're, you're going to have to learn to how to identify your your red seaweeds. It's not something you have to do immediately, but it is something you'll have to do at some point. Um, and as I said, the king scallop uh, Pectum maximus. Uh, it, large size and one flash um one I always get confused between con convex and concave con one one convex um, <laughs> uh, uh, shell but um if you have them um you, you'll tend to get uh, enough large examples to to make it obvious what you have there whereas you don't don't get, tend to get a lot of the smaller scallops in seagrass beds. Then a sand mason is one of the one of these um, tube building worms um, that build it, that tends to be covered in um, bits of whatever is debris is lying around. And um, I think there's anything you're likely to confuse it with, or unless you came along and just found a tube with no worm in it. But um, we shouldn't be identifying tubes with no worms in, in, in them, um, unless you're a polychaete expert, in which case I, I apologize and identify whatever worms you want. I couldn't find any photos of lugworms because even, even I'm not bad enough that I go around taking photos of lugworms, but I did find this in a bycatch of me taking a photo of someone else taking a photo of, <laughs> I, I presume it's the Sargassum brother of the lugworm, but just here down at the bottom, lugworm casts are an ectolet. You see them on the beach um, and you'll see them in, in seagrass habitats. And then peacock worms, um, I've more shown this to illustrate the difference between that and the sand mason tube, but um, there's a whole bunch of different things you can confuse with peacock worms unless you're looking at um, sort of very distinctive individuals like this. But again, something to keep an eye out for and to consult sky books and take some photos and to just sort of get comfortable around idea. Dragonets, expect to see loads of dragonets in, uh, in, in seagrass habitat, big dragonets, small dragonets, different species of dragonets. I'm not going to talk about dragonets at all because there is a 50 minute video of by someone who is actually good at identifying dragonets and it goes to all of the things you need to know to identify your dragonet species. Um, and as well, it, it also goes to things like sand gobies and rock gobies, which, which again will be useful for, for ID in seagrass uh, habitats. Then uh, the place to 
uh, large individuals are extremely distinctive um, at this lovely photo. But this is the queue. Um, uh, they have these uh, bright orange spots uh, and, and they're, they're extremely distinctive. But an awful lot of the time, what you'll be seeing in seagrass habitat, just to be aware, is like the smaller individuals that are sort of trying to hide themselves in the sand. And uh, could be quite difficult to identify. But uh, we're keeping an eye out for um, worth um, insofar as you can brushing up on your flatfish ID. So like I said, place are relatively easy to identify. Flounder are quite have a quite a distinctive shape. Um, but after that, you start getting into the top dots and things like that. And, and life is too short. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the RAS species because that, that's been covered in, in other talks. Uh, there's information on the website. Uh, I think there might even be another video on the YouTube channel um, covering it. Um, but there's six species of RAS in Irish waters um, that you need to get to know. Rock hook, corpon RAS, ban RAS, uh, cuckoo RAS and gold sinnies. I, sorry, uh, rock hook are here. I'm not sure. Do you? I can't think. I can't think off the top of my head of ever seeing a rock cook in a cigarette bed. But I, I don't. I wouldn't rule it out uh, either. Uh, cork and grass. Yeah, I'd expect to see them in, in seagrass, but not in great numbers. Ballon grass. Ballon grass are pretty much everywhere, so I expect to see some of them. Never seen a cuckoo grass in a seagrass bed. Uh, I think they just stand out. I think you'd be able to spot them from a mile away. Um, and. Gold sinnies, again, gold sinnies are a bit like Balmoras, you find them everywhere. You'd expect to see gold sinnies in uh, seagrass habitats, but not in massive numbers. But one of the things you do need to be aware of in seagrass is stuff like this. This is mad looking individual. Uh, so that's this is a small Balmoras, but I, I didn't know they could do that. But I don't know, is that is that color permanent? Is there a big... Um, is there a big green, green um, ballon ras wandering the seabeds of Blackside Bay, scaring the shit out of people, or um, will it change its colour as it gets older? But um, yeah, it, he'd be hard enough to spot. Um, and dogfish, uh, it's only two species of dogfish in Irish waters. Um, there's the Cialis uh, canicula. Which is the the guy here, the the less spotted dogfish, um, which you tend to get in in seagrass beds a lot. Um, the trick in identifying the two is this is Slyrianus stellaris. It's much bigger, fatter, chunkier looking uh, individual with um, more widely spread spots, but. Um, you can get extremely large individuals, uh, uh, at canicula individuals, like larger than like guidebooks and things like that will tell you that you'll find. And there's the temptation to go, oh, well, if it's this big, it can't, you know, the book says 1.5 meters and that guy must have been two meters if he was one. I, I would not use that as a bait. I would not use the length as a basis. The Stellaris is they're just a much bigger, fatter, chunkier looking fish. And once you've seen one Stellaris, you're never going to make that, that identification confusion again. Like that's how distinctive I, I, I would say they are. Uh, two spot gobies are really easy to identify. They have two spots. One, two. And unlike the other gobies, they tend to be pelagic. They tend to be swimming around in the water column rather than sitting on the ground. Uh, and again, you find them pretty much in every habitat. But if you're if you're not seeing big, particularly if it's relatively calm, if you're not seeing big swarms of two spot gobies swimming around the top of your seagrass bed, I, I, I'd be worried. And then, as it is a nursery habitat for juvenile gadoids, you would expect to see um, some pollock in there, but not big uh, whoppers like this guy, um, small little individuals. Uh, the extremely small ones, uh, in extremely small individuals, it is difficult to tell the difference between a pollock and a scythe. So I wouldn't worry about it. I, I would just report uh, record them as uh, pollock spa, 
uh, because the small guys, you, you're not going to be able to identify them because what you're looking for to identify the mesthesis is Pollock have this kink in the lateral line and the lower jaw is longer than the upper jaw. But like if you're looking at a, a fish that's like 10 or 15 centimetres long that's darting by you in a show, you're not going to pick up on those details. But uh, we'll finish off then with the with the good stuff, which is you get stuff like stickleback in uh, seagrass beds and uh, like stickleback. Stickleback are class looking fish. They it's just nothing. There's nothing that looks. They look. I suppose they look a bit like a pipefish, but there's nothing that looks remotely like them in um, in Irish waters. Uh, so I, I don't think there's really any real identity confusion. And some of them seemingly are very, very curious and very photogenic. Um, this is a lovely photo by Joe Fitzgibbons of, of independent divers. Um, and then pipefish, uh, I, I wouldn't spend a lot of time talking about pipefish because they're extremely difficult to identify the species, except for the pipe, uh, the snake pipefish, um, which had um, long curled, uh, this banding on the body tends to be orange in color. Um, but I you, you see them doing weird things like this, sort of standing straight up um, in the seagrass. Um, I try to be camouflaged and, and even to the extent I've like I've seen people pick them up on their fingers and the, the pipefish is still pretending that um it's been uh, <laughs> that it, it's camouflaged and then last up but not least the small spined sea scorpion which you again you would expect to find in um in seagrass habitats this guy's obviously on rock uh, but how you identify them a small um Small uh, fish, about less than 25 centimeters, in, no, so less than 20 centimeters in length. But um, how you identify them from other uh, similar species is you look for this little barbel here on the lip, which uh, any sort of half decent photo um, will show. So that's the end of the talk. Um, like I said, it really is like a whistle stop. Um, uh, on this, and it, it's more just to sort of um, inspire is the wrong word. It prompt. It, 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 it's intended as a prompt for a species that you expect to find in seagrass habitats, and that um, you should be looking for and get an idea of the sort of uh, groups of species that, that you should be keeping an eye out for. And uh, <laughs> excuse me. And like I said, um, if you're in Galway on the eighth of May. Come along and join us um, in the aquarium for what promises to be a, a really interesting night. I'm going to stop the recording there. You can find it.